Well, as you may know, we are looking through a series, what Christmas is really all about. And uh, tonight, we're going to be focusing on one of the issues that often come to people when they say, well, what is Christmas about? Most per- people, certainly in the Western world, would love Christmas. I don't know many people who really hate Christmas. And they would see it as a great opportunity to enjoy themselves. But how many of them would seriously put the celebration of the Lord Jesus Christ right at the heart and say that's the biggest occasion of Christmas. That's the thing I look forward to most. Well, hopefully if you're a Christian, you will. But how many people in the world would say that? Now, of course, they might pay lip service to uh, Christian things, maybe go along to a carol service just to feel a little bit more Christmassy. After all, isn't Christmas something to do with the nativity story, and it wouldn't be right if we didn't have that in there as well. But really honestly, would they absolutely have the full focus on Christ? Because that is what Christmas is really all about. That's really the ultimate answer we're going for, isn't it, here? But people do have different reasons, and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at some of those views. And tonight, we're going to think about the family, and this idea that is very strong, it root, strongly rooted in our traditions, that Christmas is all about the family. Now, I want for a moment to consider this through the view or through the lens of some popular Christmas films to make my point that for many people, Christmas, as far as Christmas is concerned, it's saturated with this idea that it's all about family. Now, don't get me wrong, there Family is important in Christmas, but it's not the be and end all of Christmas, is it? So let's take the first one, an old classic weepy. It's a wonderful life. If you've not seen this, you've missed out on something. What's the picture? Well, look at the picture itself. It's a family hugging together, embracing. Now, the story is basically about George Bailey, who's down on his luck. He's in great debt, and he attempts to finish his life. But he's shown via an angel what life would be, we've got to make allowances for Hollywood, what life would be like if he'd never existed. And he gets this view of life and what happens to other people around him because he's not there and all the, the, the missing factor that he's not there. But of course, what it's really all about is a good old family film. And he realizes in the, in the end that life is indeed wonderful, that family is important. And there's no mention of Christ except in the most peripheral way. What about another classic? And You've got it in various updated versions, Miracle on 34th Street. The purpose of the film, again, is the miracle. Uh, Little Susan is granted a wish that she could have a dad, a house, and a baby brother. It's all about the family, isn't it, once more? And in essence, that's really what the, the crux of the film is about. Let's have a family. Okay, Santa's brought in along the way. What about another film then? Another favourite, Elf. The film is about a human raised as an elf who searches for his real biological father on earth, causing some chaos along the way. But what's it actually about? A son seeking his father. Once more, the all-important focus of Christmas is family. And what about Home Alone? Poor Kevin McAllister is accidentally left at home by his family. Great fun at first as he slobs in front of the TV, watching films and gorging on pizza, until, of course, the two baddies arrive. But all's well in the end when Mum returns, followed by the rest of the family, and we get a lovely, closing, snowy scene of family reunion. After all, Christmas is all about family. Now, we couldn't leave it without Dickens, and uh, I have to include this film, otherwise John would never forgive me. (laughs) But the family Christmas classic, of course, is uh, Scrooge, and there are many adaptions. This is the Muppet version. What's it all about? Well, it's about an old miser, Scrooge, who learns through a series of ghostly encounters to reform, to become generous, and to value the family that he's neglected. And of course, a sub-theme running through it is another family, isn't it? The Cratchit family. Again, it's all about family. Now, the question is, 
how did the family come to dominate our Christmases? Here are some possible reasons. Consumerism. As we see, as we've already seen in films, family life is a great selling point. Whether it's through entertainment, the purchase of food or presents, the family helps to sell it. You could argue it's culture. We are now in a largely post-Christian culture. We no longer value the truths that the Christian faith we once valued. But the dilemma is, for many people, they don't want to lose Christmas. They don't want Christ, so we end up with a Christless vacuum. And what do you fill it with? Many things, but one is the family. Or it could be choice. We value our family to the point where it can be the only thing that matters. And that is what we determine Christmas will be about. Well, I want to challenge that as the Bible uh, teaches very plainly that whilst family certainly has a place, it's not the be and end all of Christmas. So I want to look at this under three headings. God's family plan. For many then, the real meaning of Christmas has been obliterated by the family or by other things. Yet the real irony here is that Christmas is about a family. But not in the way it's generally conceived. At the heart of the Christmas story is a family. Mary, Joseph, baby Jesus. On a much bigger canvas, God's plan is all about a family, his family. He is the father of of an innumerable family, which has been made possible only by the events of Christmas and Easter. We need to remember that the family is God's idea as well. Family is not something that sort of evolved as society society developed and was accepted as the most useful and stabilizing way to keep society going. That's a sociological argument. It's not a biblical one. Family life begins with God in Genesis, in the creation that God made, the first family, Adam and Eve. And what were they told to do? They were told to be fruitful and to fill the earth, to have children. That's a family. And this was the original purpose that God had, that there would be this family on earth. Now, as we know... Adam and Eve sinned, and the family line was ruined. Sin came into the world via Satan, and things changed. But God was not finished with the world. He's not finished with the human life and the family. From within that very family, a savior would one day be born. Do you know the very first Christmas message? It's in Genesis 3, chapter 15. Not in Matthew or Luke. And it's this. And I will put, he's speaking to the serpent who had brought this disaster about through tempting Adam and Eve. He says to him, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He, the one coming, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That's the first gospel promise. It's the first Christmas message. This was the promise of a savior that would come, that would defeat Satan and his powers and restore the family that had been almost ruined. From that point on, God selected a family. And in our recent studies on the life of Joseph, we've been considering some of that family, haven't we? Of course, it doesn't start with Jacob. It goes back to Adam, really. But then it goes on to Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and so on. There's a development, and this family grows, and it's in Egypt, and we, we, we've ended off that series there. And they're known as the Israelites after Jacob's other name, Israel, or sometimes as Judaism after Judah, who became the main line through which the Savior would come. And in this family, as it grew, it would eventually uh, grow 
And we, the whole of the Old Testament is really about this great family, family nation, really. We see this family, and we see it going its ups and downs. We see its failures and its triumphs. And all the way through it, God was preparing a people, a family nation. More than that, it wasn't just to be one nation, Israel. God's family would be much wider to eventually include all nations. There are many promises in the Old Testament. I had a quick look at them this afternoon, and in the end, there was just too many that speak of the Gentiles in the Old Testament. But here's one uh, to be going on with, Genesis 22, verse 18. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. If you particularly look at the book of Isaiah, you get, it, it really builds up and we find the name Gentiles being used uh, because through this savior, other nations would be blessed. God's plan was to have a, a huge family, a great family of people who would be in covenant with him. And so we have, coming to this reading, we've got how this nation would be prepared Second point, God was in the family. Not only did God plan a family, he entered into a particular family in order to do this. And of course, this is the great Christmas story, isn't it? Well, Christians uh, are often focused on families. Uh, Sorry, well, Christmas is rather focused on families and we, we, we shouldn't take that too far. We don't dismiss it either. It's this important aspect of the Christmas story, isn't it? It's about a family. Jesus was born into one. We have this account in the very first chapter of Matthew's gospel. And uh, we're told that Jesus was, in every sense, human. He's got a genealogy. Uh, We could have read it out. I avoided that for uh, for good reasons. Um, But it's there, isn't it? Look at it. It tells us that he was really human. He had ancestry. And it's tracing there through the line of his adopted father, Joseph. Now, while Joseph wasn't his biological father, he was his legal father. And that's important. So that Jesus could trace his heritage through Joseph's line right back to his royal roots, to King David himself. So he had a right to be king. Incidentally, in Luke 3, we've got his genealogy traced through Mary's line. And that will take you back to David as well. So in a double sense, Jesus has every right to be king because through his uh, legal father, Joseph, he could trace his roots back to King David, and through his maternal roots, his mother Mary, he could do likewise. And of course, that reminds us that he is the God-man, Jesus. We'll talk about more of that a little bit later. The story here, though, sets us with a problem, doesn't it? You see, Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Now, betrothed is much stronger than engagement, it's not quite marriage, but it's, it's, it's almost as good as marriage. It's in the single, but you're, you're so committed to the marriage that the idea of breaking a betrothal is almost unthinkable. But Joseph has a problem. Mary is pregnant. And understandably, he's perplexed. What's he going to do? And he actually plans. He's a, he's a good man. He's a kind man. And without considering how... She got pregnant. He's prepared to try and uh, divorce her quietly. But of course he has this intervention of an angel to tell him, to make it clear to him that what Mary has done is not wrong. Indeed, the very opposite. This is a holy child from from the Holy Spirit himself. And so he realizes now that Everything is different. It's not as he thought. Let's just read what it says here. Make it absolutely clear. The angel says this, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because 
What is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah. The virgin will conceive, give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is an incredible thought, isn't it? It brings us back to the greatest mystery of the Christian faith, that Jesus is both perfectly man and perfectly God. He's not 50% man and 50% God that makes up uh, this, this person. He's in every sense God. And yet at the same time, in every sense, man. It's not a mixture. It's a perfect union. Now, I can't fully grasp that, and I'm sure you can't. But I believe it, because the Bible teaches both truths. And indeed, if he wasn't both man and God, he could never have been a saviour. Because if he was merely a man, uh, bearing the sin of the world would have obliterated him. He couldn't have coped with that. And of course, if he was a God and not a man, then he couldn't have been our substitute because he had to be a human being like us. He was our representative. He was the God-man, Jesus Christ. And that is what Christmas is about. Yes, the family has a part to play in it, but the supreme thing is what God did in this particular family to create a new family, the family and the people of God That Jesus came into this world. Why did he come into this world? Well, he came into this world to save sinners like you and me. He came in this world to be the rescuer. To put right what had been put, what was wrong. To destroy the works of the devil, we're told. Many, many reasons we could talk about, but ultimately to be our savior. And to enable us through that to be part of his family. And that brings me to the final point, which is this, belonging to God's family. Now, maybe you're not a Christian, or perhaps you are a Christian, but you, you, you oscillate between knowing and not knowing and, and losing your, your sense of assurance, so you're not really sure. Now, some people have the idea that we are part of God's family automatically, by birth or nationality. But this is simply not true. Now, in the sense that we are created, we are part of the human family, and in that sense, we're children of God. But that's not what the Bible means by children of God. Just as we come into a human family by physical birth, and there's no exception to that, is it? We all come into the human, human race by a physical birth. So there's no other exception in becoming a Christian. You come by a spiritual birth into the family. In John 3, we have that great story of Nicodemus and his encounter with John. Now, Nicodemus, we need to remember, was a highly respected religious leader, a theologian, if you like, a, a, a leader of, uh, uh, that was known and proved. And he came with these uh, discussions to Jesus. And Jesus cuts right across all of that. And he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Or more, more correctly, you must be born from above. You've got to have a second birth. And we know in, this, in the narrative that Nicodemus doesn't understand what Jesus is talking about. He's thinking of physical birth. And Jesus has to say, you've got to be born of the spirit. And that is the great truth of entering into God's family. We have to be born again. Just as we enter this human family that we belong to by birth, so we enter God's family through a birth. Not a physical one, of course, but a spiritual one. But what does that mean? It sounds a bit jargon, doesn't it? Born again. And sometimes the the term has been devalued by its overuse and certain people making claims about it that they shouldn't do. What does it mean to be born of the Spirit? 
Well, let me try and give a few simple steps to make it clear. Firstly, for a person to be born in the Spirit, there has to be a recognition in the first place that they are a sinner, that they are at war with God in a sense, and they need to make peace with him because a sinner and a holy God just cannot connect. They're like the wrong, end, wrong sides of the, the magnets. You know when you get magnets, remember as children, when you're trying to push the magnets together, and there's that force field that prevents it happening, and there's no way you can get them, you can force them together, but they'll push apart. It's like that with God. God is holy, and we are sinful, and so there's a repulsion, quite literally, Something has to happen to us. We have to be turned around. And of course, as you know with a magnet, if you turn the magnet around, no problem. But there has to be that turning around first. And we have to recognize this. And we live in a very subtle world where we say, well, sinners, they're people who do bad things, aren't they? They go to prison, that rob people. And Well, yes, they are. But sin is much wider than that. All of us sin in all sorts of ways. And uh, James tells us if we sin on one little occasion it's as if we've sinned on everything so there's no way we can sort ourselves out or get right with God in that sense the second thing is to recognize that Christ is the only one who can deal with that because he has become our substitute he's done something for us he's taken our place and borne the sin that was that we had and taken God's wrath that we should have had. He's done it for us. He's satisfied God's demands. And then again, we might say, but that was 2,000 years ago. How can that connect with me today in the 21st century in UK? I mean, how, how can you bridge that time? Well, let me try and explain it like this. First, you have to believe it's true. What happened there historically when Jesus came into this world as a baby and then later he grew up and he died on a cross and then he rose from there. You have to believe those facts. They are true. They are history. And then you have to uh, apply it to yourself. And you can span across the ages. It's not a problem for God. He can do that. Yes, you say, but how does it still apply to me? Well, the first thing is that we have to accept that we are such sinners. And that's a hard thing to do because none of us wants to admit that we're wrong. You know, even in our day-to-day um, ups and downs of life, whether it's with work colleagues or even within the family, we hate to admit that we're in the wrong. And sometimes we're not, but sometimes we are. But it's also hard to admit it, isn't it? We have to come before God and accept that we are sinners And we need forgiveness and that only he can take away your sin. It's what the Bible calls repentance. And repentance means turning around, turning and going in the other direction. It's like that magnet. When the magnet turns around, there's an attraction. If the magnet refuses to turn, there's repulsion. If we refuse to turn, we're like that magnet. We can never be attracted to God and God can never be attracted to us. We repulse each other. And that's how we'll stay. So there has to be a move on our part. Thankfully, it's done by God's grace. God does the work. God makes us willing. God helps us. That's repentance. And then the other aspect is we have to believe with our mind and our heart and our soul, absolutely, completely, in every sense, that what he has done on the cross is sufficient. And the Bible calls that faith. Repentance and faith, they're the two key words that make this possible. Let me sum it up in, one John, in John 1, 12 to 13. These are, the way, these are the things that enable us to enter into the family. Here's John's words. Yet to all who did receive him, many did reject him, but to all who did receive him, to those who believed In his name, faith and repentance, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent, not of human decision 
or husband's will, but born of God. Can I leave that challenge with you, whether you're listening online or whether you're even here? Do you know that you're born of God? Do you know that you're in God's family? Yes, Christmas is not entirely about family, but it is about a family. It's about God's family. It's about the opportunity that Jesus gives you to become part of his family through this way. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are such a God. We thank you, Lord, that you enable us to come to you. We could come no other way. There's nothing we could do to receive this. We can't earn it. We can't become Christians by virtue of our nationality or anything like that. There is nothing we can do, but you have done it for us. You entered into a human family. You took upon the sin that was ours. You provided the way for us to come to you. And we give you our heartfelt thanks. Oh, Lord, we just pray you touch all our lives. If we know you, then may we rejoice in this great truth. If we don't know you, then Lord, may this be the most important thing that we will consider today. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.